Hey everyone, this is lecture 7 for POS 273 International Relations, an online undergraduate course taught at the University of Maine, and I'm the instructor Rob Glover. Um, so today we're diving back into theoretical perspectives and we're going to talk about a theoretical perspective known as constructivism or social constructivism. Um, so we'll talk about a number of things. Um, one, what is constructivism and what are its basic assumptions? Uh, because as the the social constructivism title implies that this is more focused on social interaction. Uh, we're going to move away from some of the more rationalist material assumptions of realism and liberalism and talk about the social world a little bit. So how do things like norms and rhetoric and public arguments shape outcomes in international relations? Um, while other perspectives are going to say that those things are an outgrowth of the material factors, social constructivists are going to say, no, those are actually really key variables. They make things possible. They make identities. They produce outcomes in international relations. Um, and so we'll talk about that a little bit. How does that work? And then we'll move into our application. So we'll talk about how might a constructivist explain the Iraq war. We have a couple different explanations that we're presented with. Um, and then I really like this section uh, from Dresner about constructivism and zombie fiction. Um, I think it, it pulls into focus uh, some of the things that I find most interesting about constructivism. Um, so we're going to talk about his work and um, the insights that we draw from zombie th fiction and thinking about the constructivist perspective on international relations. So um, to start off, we have to talk about what it means to say that something exists as a social construction. If we say, um, you know, gender is a social construction or uh, our, our, the way that we behave in public is socially constructed. What does that actually mean? Um, and so usually when I teach this, I'll use some sort of example of commonplace everyday activity. Uh, and social constructivists are going to argue that social construction shapes what we do in our everyday lives, but it, that carries over. It, it extends up to international relations and what happens in the international realm. Um, so we'll start at the level of our everyday lives. Uh, first and foremost, I'm going to show you two situations here that um, you are probably familiar with. You have probably engaged in these, uh, some of you, on a daily basis. Uh, one is individuals waiting in line, right? And there's a, a joke there with somebody who's been waiting in line so long that they've died and their body is decomposed and they're a skeleton. Um, the second is an elevator which um, normally when I present these in the classroom, uh, you know, I say, what are these people doing? And then I ask why, right? Um, so when we get into an elevator, we get in, we hit our button for our floor, and then we all face the front, and usually we kind of stare up at the, um, the changing floors, right? And if you want to make people really uncomfortable in an elevator, uh, people that you don't know, if you get into an elevator and you turn and face them and look at them, people find that threatening. Uh, or if you uh, just face the other way, right, stare at the back of the elevator, people find that threatening, it makes them uncomfortable. And we can think about why that is, right? Um, you're in an enclosed space with people you don't know. Um, people value their personal space, particularly in the United States. This varies from culture to culture. And so when you're in an enclosed space with someone, you want to try to create distance. And if you can't create physical distance, then you create social distance. And so the idea then, uh, and, and think of this in other public places too, if you're on a crowded train or uh, whatever it might be, is we, we create social distance by our behavior, right? So the question is, why do we do this? Um, why, when we get our stuff in the supermarket or the pharmacy, we put it in a basket and then we have to pay for our stuff, so they'll put it in the the bags and we can take it out to our car. Um, why do we behave in this way? There is no law that dictates that we have to stand in line before we purchase our goods. If you um, decided to kind of crowd towards the front and, and get as close to the belt as you could, uh, you wouldn't be thrown in jail, but you would face social condemnation, social pressure. And there's social expectations that we ingrain uh, into our daily practice in such a way that we wouldn't imagine doing anything else. And sometimes we don't even think of these things. They become so automatic that there's no question that that is what we would do. Um, an interesting experiment to, to do is to break a social norm. You know, you don't want to break something uh, that is 
really fundamental and, and would make people uncomfortable and would put you in danger. But, you know, just next time you get into an elevator, like turn to the person next to you and say hello and see how they react. And maybe they'll be friendly and nice, but a lot of people won't. A lot of people will be kind of freaked out that you're breaking the social norm. Um, or if you're standing in line, you're waiting to purchase something, you know, turn around and look behind you and smile at the person behind you. Um, and sometimes that's, you know, people will be friendly and they'll, they'll enjoy that social interaction. But a lot of times people won't um, because it breaks with our social expectations. It breaks with the social norms. So these social constructions did not always exist and do not exist in every place in the world. If you've traveled around the world, you may have noticed that the line of standing in, in uh, the, the norm of standing in line varies from one culture to another. So social constructions are culturally conditioned. And you may go to you know, another place in the world and that line doesn't exist. Uh, and people kind of crowd around and you fight to get to the front. Right? Um, so these things emerge over time and we reinforce and recreate them. And then eventually they take on a life of their own. Right? They have a stickiness, uh, an embeddedness in our everyday activities that is very hard to break or change. And constructivists in international relations are going to say that in the same way that these social practices emerge over time and become embedded and expected, and there's repercussions if you violate them, in the same way that happens in international relations. This is a quote um, drawn from Bon Hoffman, um, who are constructivist scholars of international relations. It's quoted in uh, Sterling Folk and Folker's chapter. But they say, nothing of what is right or wrong, feasible or infeasible, indeed possible or impossible, uh, sorry, notions of what is <laughs> right or wrong, feasible or infeasible, indeed impossible or impossible, are all part of an actor's social context. And it is these ideas that shape what actors want, who actors are, and how actors behave. So in the context of international relations, our notions of what we should do, who we are, and how others should behave are shaped by norms. It's shaped by the social context. You know, there are material limitations. There are um, concrete factors in the world um, that condition and shape what we do. But so much of what happens in international relations, according to constructivists, is shaped by the social world and social expectations. Uh, it is not simply a matter of rational calculus. It is not simply a matter of capacities or power. It is very much shaped by how we socially interact. And that really drives all of the analysis for constructivists within IR. Another important thing to consider as we start to talk about social structures and the ways that they shape our behavior is this idea of um, the agent structure debate. So this is drawn from sociology, and really the idea of social construction is drawn from sociology. This is a matter of international relations and political science appropriating a set of ideas that seem to make sense of international relations in interesting ways. Um, for constructivists, international relations is a space in which we are free agents. We have freedom. Uh, and we have the power to create social norms and institutions. So we can advance a norm and then through our behavior and through our construction of institutions, we make that norm more powerful over time. But then we become constrained and our field of action is inhibited by the social structures that we as free agents create. Um, so it's this, this model in which, yes, we do have freedom. Yes, we operate in a setting in which we, we make choices and we're not just conditioned to behave in certain ways. But then the choices that we make over time become um, have power to shape how individuals and, and we ourselves behave. And that field of action, that field of total freedom to do what, whatever we want becomes more limited. Um, and so for constructivists, the goal really then is to understand that creation of structure, of social structure, and when and how we can change or operate outside of it, right? When are the moments in which the social structure, the social norm breaks down and somebody does something else, an actor, a representative of a country chooses a different path than what the social expectations are. So 
really interesting, really um, kind of mind-bending way to think about international relations uh, and very influential. A lot of the work that's going on in international relations right now, trying to understand the world, is operating from this frame of constructivism. While realism and liberalism uh, are very old perspectives of thinking about international affairs and, and the relations between states, the interactions that happen at the international level, constructivism is fairly new. Uh, it's a fairly new way of thinking about this. All right, so what are the basic assumptions of constructivism? The first is social construction. It's the idea that patterns of social interaction create meaning and subsequent interactions are going to reinforce that meaning. Or in very rare instances, they will dismantle it. So you can have uh, a pattern of interaction that goes against the existing social norm and in going against it, it breaks these embedded notions that this is how a state ought to behave. Um, to give you a, a concrete example, uh, in the United States right now, under the presidency of Donald Trump, uh, we have a lot of norms of executive power that are being changed, right? We have a very different president, a different background, a different level of past public service. Uh, even presidents in the past who had similar policy positions to Donald Trump operated with a certain set of constraints, a certain way that they carried themselves, a certain way that they interacted with Congress and the public and media uh, and the other executive agencies. And Donald Trump is operating in a different way. And so the question is, does this action that breaks with longstanding social norms, um, does that mean that the social norms no longer apply? Does that mean that subsequent presidents will behave in different ways as well? Or um, does the elastic kind of snap back? And once you have this individual uh, no longer president, the, the norms resume, right? But you can think of that in international relations as well. That's a domestic example, but you could think of ways in which uh, you know, a country violates some really important international norm. Syria is, you know, using uh, chemical and biological weapons against its own population, which is a big no-no, you know, violation of a really important international norm. But after this war is over, uh, you know, does that mean other bad actors throughout the world are going to do this, or does the, is this just kind of a singular exception? So this idea of social construction, it's not just this philosophical exercise. We're thinking about how social construction creates ideas and creates meaning, but then how it shapes um, action in the future. Uh, we're also going to talk a lot about uh, institutions in constructivism. And here, institutions mean um, really kind of practical expectations, um, patterns of interaction, that emerge over time to govern international interaction. Um, it doesn't even have to be as specific as a, a treaty or the um, behavior that we see within an international organization. It can just be something very abstract. Um, but institutions, when we talk about them in the context of constructivism, are particularly sticky patterns of interaction. They're hard to change. They're hard to dislodge. And they govern international interaction, and they generate norms which when we use that term norms in international relations, all we mean is collective expectations of behavior with regulative effects. So it regulates how states and their representatives behave um, with, on actors of a given ident identity. Right? So if you are a, a representative of a state, there is a certain set of norms. If you are um, a military commander, there is a certain set of norms that exist. Right. Um, lastly, ideational power. So the ways that we have been talking about power to this point have largely been material. And um, from the realist perspective and from the Marxist perspective, which we'll talk about later this week, uh, power is thought of largely in material terms. And for a constructivist, power is more than material power. It's more than how big is your military, how big is your gross domestic product. It's also the power of ideas. Um, and ideas conceived relationally. So your ability to influence others, your ability to tap into shared notions of what uh, ideas mean, right? Um, and influence meaning and perception. That is a very important source of power um, and how it influences the international system is a very key concern of constructivists. So those are some basic assumptions of constructivism. The implications of the constructivist worldview are um, 
really important, right? Constructivism, how constructivism emerged as a different way of thinking about international relations is really in response to the Cold War. Um, the dominant perspectives at that time were the liberal, liberals, the realists, the Marxist perspectives, and nobody, very few people, saw the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War happening, right? And there was really nothing in the theories to explain it. Um, for the most part, realism and liberalism, at least, are focused on either enduring uh, realities about international politics or small, piecemeal, incremental change. Realists, I think, are focused on kind of the enduring nature of power politics. Liberals are focused on incremental, piecemeal change over time, right? Um, but very few theories or frameworks of understanding IR could conceive of rapid change, right? And the question that constructivists struggle with uh, is not just how does change occur, but they're really asking why is there not constant change? If so much of what we do in international relations is not determined by the system, it is not inevitable uh, based on the structure, and it is largely the function of social agreement, why are we not seeing constant change? Why is there not just constant, why are there not, you know, what, why do we have anything that endures over time if it's just a matter of kind of social expectation as opposed to something fixed and material and uh, something that's very hard to escape? Uh, and the constructivist world, you suggest that identity and self-understanding of international actors like states and international organizations is what really dr drives how they behave. And that can get us to a point in which we can understand why we're not grappling with constant change. They argue that actors follow a logic of appropriateness rather than a mere logic of consequences. So for instance, if a foreign policy uh, decision maker is thinking about whether or not they should do something, they're not simply saying, would this work? How would it benefit us? They're saying, given our identity in international relations, given who we are and what we represent in the world, is it appropriate if we do this? Does it follow with the norms and expectations and social, um, the social dimensions of what we represent in the world, not simply will it work and will it get us what we want, right? So you can think about that in, um, in very concrete ways, right? So uh, here's a couple hypothetical questions, but run through some different hypotheticals. Um, so if Canada has material resources that we want and we need, why would we not go to war with them? Why not just invade them? Um, and for, for a constructivist, they're going to say because there is this relationship between the United States and Canada, which makes that almost unthinkable. You know, it's very, very hard to imagine what is the, the set of circumstances that would have to unfold for us to look to our north and see Canada as a potential adversary that we'd be willing to engage in military conflict against. A constructivist is going to say all of that is down to a logic of appropriateness. It is down to a set of expectations that have emerged over time and are very, very hard to break. Um, Second question, if imperialism, if having colonies throughout the world, if you know, the United States uh, decided that it wanted resources that are in Africa or Southeast Asia, uh, why, why not just restart imperialism? Why not go take over some countries with weak militaries and colonize them? It worked pretty well uh, at enriching the developed world. Uh, many of the economic superpowers were uh, founded on this practice of political and military takeover and then economic extraction. So why don't we still have it? Um, now, if you're operating from the point of view of realism, you might say that it became too costly uh, and it weakened states overall power and ability to defend themselves to have all these different outposts throughout the world. But constructivists are going to give you a different answer. They're going to say it's no longer appropriate. If Britain were to have a domestic political system that is democratic, to value liberty and freedom, to talk about diversity and equality, and then it were to go and take over another country and subject it to military and political domination in an effort to extract economic resources, that would be highly inappropriate. 
it would appear that they were hypocrites, that they were engaged in something that was fundamentally wrong. They would face condemnation from the international community. It would be viewed as a violation of sovereignty. They would probably be rebuked by uh, the United Nations in some respects. So the international community would rally against them. So a constructivist would say that this is rooted in social expectations. It's not rooted necessarily in material capabilities or uh, you know, the ability to actually accomplish something. It's whether or not what you would accomplish would be appropriate. So that's a different perspective. That's a really different way to think about international relations. All right, so we have a couple different explanations in the chapter from Jennifer Sterling Foker um, of the Iraq War. One is from uh, Hoffman, who uh, we, we cited uh, some of his work earlier in this presentation. And uh, the other is from a guy named Patrick Thaddeus Jackson, who looks at constructivism a little bit differently. He's more interested in the relational elements um, and public discourse, public rhetoric, uh, what becomes commonplace in international relations. So with Hoffman, um, he's making an argument primarily based on norms. Um, he's saying that um, international norms are useful, but they don't provide fully specified rules for every situation, right? So there was this norm that Iraq was in violation of, right? Um, or it was at least feared that Iraq was developing weapons of mass destruction, and they were certainly in violation of the expectation of um, regular inspections submitting to um, the scrutiny of the international community. Um, at the point at which they are no longer cooperating with the international community, they're in violation of that norm, there is a split within the major powers um, about how to deal with the fact that Iraq was in violation of international norms. Right? Um, he goes back to the first Gulf War, again an instance in which Iraq was in violation of an international norm. They had invaded Kuwait, they had invaded another sovereign country. They were doing something that was largely viewed to be destabilizing in the region and was viewed to be um, an unlawful and dangerous action that was threatening regional stability and peace. And there was general agreement. There was convergence within the large alliance that fought the first Gulf War in what the norm was and what the proper response was. And so therefore, after you know the internal debates within countries about whether we should authorize military spending and troops, the international community spoke uh, with a pretty common voice in the first Gulf War and committed um, troops and, and uh, personnel to a military action that had a fairly limited mandate. The idea was to get Iraq out of Kuwait, not to try to get Saddam Hussein out of power, not to try to ensure regime, regime change. What the UN authorized was a fairly limited mandate. The Iraq war that uh, was undertaken in 2003 is very different, right? Um, and specifically what Hoffman is arguing is that we see a split within the major powers that would potentially form an alliance here uh, in interpretation of the norms, interpretation of what the proper response to Iraq's uh, non-compliance ought to be. Um, so uh, in his chapter, um, he actually quotes uh, from a joint statement by the French, German, and Russian governments. So remember that the United States brought this before the UN Security Council. They were saying that this uh, justifies military action and the United States is prepared to undertake military action, but we want the approval, approval of the international community. And um, so they were making the argument, this is a violation of norms. The proper response to this violation of norms is, and in, at that point it was a little bit unclear, but eventually it would become clear that the proper response was an invasion, an attempt to um, get rid of Saddam Hussein, right? To have regime change and to have Saddam Hussein no longer be in power. And the French, German, and Russian governments say, our common objective remains the full and effective disarmament of Ra Iraq in compliance with uh, resolution 1441, we consider that this objective can be achieved by the peaceful means of the inspections. Russia, Germany, and France resolutely support uh, Messrs. Blix and Alberadi and consider the meeting of the Council on March 7th to be an important step 
in the process put in place. We will not let a proposed resolution pass that would authorize the use of force. Russia and France, as permanent members of the Security Council, will assume all their responsibilities on this point. So essentially they're saying, we disagree fundamentally that the proper response to Iraq's noncompliance is use of force. And um, France and Russia both have veto power on the UN Security Council, and we are prepared to use it if the United States pushes for uh, a route to disarmament of Iraq that includes use of force. So there was pretty broad agreement on the fact that Iraq was a bad actor, that Saddam Hussein was a threat, and potentially that Iraq was um, trying to develop weapons of mass destruction, was, was in noncompliance with the expectations set earlier in the process, and then specifically with UN Resolution 1441. So there's broad agreement that he's in violation of a norm, that Hussein is in violation of a norm and Iraq is violating this norm. Um, but there is disagreement about what to do, right? And so the existence of a norm does not specify a course of action. And that's where we see contestation. That's where we see states that even agree on an international norm differ on uh, what to do as a result, what is the action. In the first Gulf War, we saw convergence. In the Iraq War, we see divergence and major powers going in different directions in terms of how they interpret a norm. Um, so we could ask all sorts of interesting questions about why that is. What is it about, uh, you know, the situation that leads uh, Germany and France and Russia to view this in different terms than uh, the United States and the UK? But the broad thing to understand is that norms don't necessarily prescribe a course of action. It doesn't necessarily tell you what your foreign policy ought to be. It just gives you some broad convergence and broad set of expectations for how states ought to behave. Now with Jackson, you get a different argument. Um, you get a different slice of um, what constructivism is. And because he's interested in something called relational constructivism, he's really interested in that, that notion of ideational power, right? The focus is gonna shift from what is the norm and how do dif different states interpret the norm to really down to the, the level of foreign policy leaders and the things that they are saying publicly about what ought to be happening, right? What the proper course of action is. So he shifts to what he calls strategies of public legitimation and the common places invoked. So by common places invoked, um, that means things like, you know, what is, what is the vocabulary that they're appealing to that is supposed to be broadly shared, that isn't contested, that isn't, there isn't a dispute over, um, over this vocabulary. Um, and he makes the case, this is a quote from his chapter, uh, he says, it follows that if we want to understand the actions of the United States in invading Iraq, we should look for the narratives that justify and shore up the acceptability of the invasion. We must pay close attention to the particular rhetorical commonplaces deployed in debates about possible courses of action, as these commonplaces and their pattern of deployment as public reasons rendered the invasion a socially sanctioned activity. All right, so the case he's making is that the Bush administration, when they brought their case to the international community, um, articulated a course of action to punish Iraq that went beyond individual interest, right? They were invoking global interests. They talk about the viability of the United Nations and the UN Security Council, and they frame this in relation to safety and security of the global community. There's also some really interesting rhetorical moves. Um, so Bush, in making his case, was talking about the United States as the defender of liberty. Uh, this is a variation on the idea of American exceptionalism, right? That the United States has always represented something unique and special in the world and has taken on the mantle of global responsibility for defending um, liberty. It's a very powerful rhetorical idea. Uh, you hear virtually every American president refer to that idea of the United States as a defender of liberty. And he also makes the case that in this particular um, strategy of public legitimation. Uh, Bush was invoking the idea of the United States as a leader in a campaign against uncivilized behavior, very much uh, in relation to um, the war on terror, right? 9-11 was only a few years in the past, and he's making the case that there are certain forms of uncivilized behavior that the civilized world has a responsibility to, um, to fight against. Um, so 
uh, Patrick Thaddeus Jackson says in his piece, uh, he reads from, from Bush's um, address before the UN General Assembly, and he says, the uses of we and all in this speech aim to position the United States as serving a purpose larger than its own narrow self-interest. The litany of universal values invoked in the speech, including human dignity, human rights, and tolerance is a familiar one with a long history both in UN declarations uh, and in the historical narratives of US identity. They form part of a general tapestry of values from which it would be difficult to dissent and still be taken seriously in a global public forum like the UN General Assembly. So no one in that setting is going to say, well, we don't believe in liberty or we don't believe in human dignity, right? They have to find a way to counter this argument. If they disagree with the United States going to war with Iraq, they have to found, find a way to counter this argument saying that those claims that the United States is making are disingenuous. Um, Patrick Thaddeus Jackson goes on to talk about this, this secondary element. Uh, he says um, in his speech, uh, note that in this characterization, terrorists are opposed to civilization and not merely to the United States. Hence, action against them and against those who would aid and abet them is a matter not confined to the United States, but a matter of global importance. The Iraqi regime is further criticized for continuing to commit violations of human rights against its own citizens. Um, and it, it goes on to talk about some of the specifics. So in all of these different respects, Bush is making a case based on a certain set of commonplaces and trying to publicly legitimate um, a, a strategy that was very controversial, that the international community by and large was not supportive of, um, of invasion of Iraq and, and potentially regime change. And the language that he's using is very strategically chosen to appeal to broad and universal norms, broad and universal expectations uh, of collective behavior in the international system. Um, so there's, there's that that piece of it, right? You can actually delve into what is the language that foreign policy leaders are using and how does it link up with or depart from these um, common expectations of how states ought to behave. All right, so moving to Dresner's piece. Um, as I said, I really like uh, this section of Dresner in which he's talking about constructivism. Um, it's interesting to think about zombie fiction in relation to constructivism because I think there are... Um, underlying elements of social construction in how we present zombies and fiction that are, are really interesting and have interesting parallels with um, international relations. I was talking with someone recently about um, how zombie fiction has emerged relatively recently to be um, you know, a, a real kind of dominant strain within American popular culture. And one of the theories about that is actually that this emerged out of 9-11 um, there is this argument that when certain types of monsters, certain fictional characters are um, dominant in popular culture, that is speaking about something much larger in society at the time. So, for instance, um, in the 1950s in Japan, there were all sorts of science fiction uh, movies in which um, you had some sort of monster that in some way was an outgrowth of of human action, like Godzilla or Mothra, right? And the case has been made that that is really a reaction to um, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, right? The, this is like a culture reckoning with the fact that science had created this monstrous tool that was then used against it in a very horrifying fashion uh, for those who were living within the, the um, society at that time. And I've heard other people make that case with zombies. They say that this focus on zombies really came about um, after 9-11, right? After we had, all of a sudden we were facing this adversary that was um, violent. A lot of that violence was targeted almost indiscriminately at civilians, you know, not um, just hard targets, but soft targets as well. Um, it was an ideology and a, a framework for um, violence that was spreading pretty quickly and it was spreading to people um, that were being radicalized. And it's an adversary that um, doesn't seem to operate according to the normal, um, the normal human characteristics of self-preservation, right? So, so much of how we fight violence, whether it be, you know, 
law enforcement or in our military is based on the idea that people don't want to die. People don't want to be hurt. Um, and with terrorism, we had people that were express, expressly trying to kill themselves, like did not care about self-preservation. In fact, had resigned themselves to the fact that they were going to die. And zombies are kind of a similar thing, right? And that zombies, they don't operate according to any sort of notion of self-preservation. Um, and so that's just something to keep in the background, right? It's, it's this idea that the reason that we're talking about zombies, the reason that zombies have become so prevalent in um, American popular culture is that we are grappling with, as a society, as a culture, something much larger. And fiction is just kind of representing that. So according to Dresner, um, zombies, when we take a look at them from the constructive constructivist perspective, one of the reasons zombies are so terrifying is that they rapidly break down existing social norms, right? Human beings are violence, violent, but we have this expectation that we're not going to uh, feast upon each other, right? <laughs> one of the most powerful taboos, one of the things that uh, almost immediately makes us uh, revolted and disgusted is the idea of like consuming another human being, cannibalism, right? Uh, but zombies don't operate according to that taboo. They don't have that taboo. Um, and they have the possibility to spread that alternative norm, that violent alternative norm and breaking of that taboo uh, to others, right? So it's not simply that they are breaking down the existing norm, but they're also advancing an alternative. And once people are, are attacked, they become part of that group. Um, so... Um, Dresner says, significant elements of the zombie canon have a constructivist bent. As cultural critics have absorbed, the horror in zombie films comes not from a single ghoul, but from an ever-expanding community of them. In other words, terror increases when a large swath of individuals are socialized into the ways of the undead. So you can think of zombieism almost as a social norm that's gone viral, right? And is, is taking over a larger and larger segment of the population. Um, Another interesting thing to consider is this question that is raised in many um, elements of zombie fiction about in order to defeat the zombies, oftentimes the human beings have to resort to barbaric and violent behavior that makes those lines between zombies and humans almost indistinguishable. Uh, so Dresner continues, he says, similarly, zombie films persistently raise questions about the identity distinctions between ghouls and humans questions provoke considerable anxiety and occasional nightmares from human protagonists. One recent, recent cultural analysis of the zombie genre says what is remarkable about so many zombie movies is that the survivors of the plague accident, alien invasion uh, that caused the infection do so little to distinguish themselves from zombies. It's very much a case of as you are, so too am I. The actions of, there's a, a pause and it goes on. The actions of the zombies and the zombie hunting posse in the night of the living dead are barely distinguishable from each other. Um, and a bit more, and he says the most iconic line in Robert Kirkman's Walking Dead comic book, which became the basis for the TV show, comes when Rick Grimes shouts in anger and despair to the rest of his group, we are the walking dead, right? This frustration that uh, the effort to confront the zombies and defeat the zombies and survive makes the humans uh, almost indistinguishable from them. Um, Dresner goes on to uh, suggest, you know, what concrete policy uh, advice constructivists would have in confronting a zombie outbreak um, in ways that are a little bit more questionable, but kind of interesting. He suggests one of the things that constructivists might strive to see is the elements of commonality in zombies. And if we could somehow re-socialize them to constitute less of a threat, right? They would never be fully human. They would never have all the norms and niceties and expectations of the human population. But he does note that zombies seem to have an element of community. They seem to have an element of, um, you know, protecting one another uh, and, and uniting against a, um, a, a, an adversary um, and that they, they live in, you know, packs. They're not isolated creatures. They have some notion of community. So maybe from a constructivist perspective, you could look at this and say, all right, is there something here? Is there some way that we could re-socialize these beasts, these, these monsters, to, um, to behave in some way that slightly more closely approximates what we expect from human beings. But anyway, that's just a lens for thinking about constructivism, for thinking about how to apply um, this theoretical perspective. And I encourage you to do that. I think constructivism, 
constructivism is one of the most interesting ways to think about and analyze things that are happening in international relations. It doesn't just have to be war and peace. You could think about this in relation to trade. You could think about this in relation to cultural diplomacy, environmentalism, right? But how do norms get promoted uh, and take root and become embedded? And also how do norms and expectations change over time? And how does the public discourse and the public rhetoric of our leaders make reference to those shared norms and shared expectations? So there's a lot of promise in, in constructivism, and I think it's a, a helpful tool to think about international relations. So for next time, uh, we're going to delve into feminism, uh, which is a really a family of, of different approaches in international relations. Um, so I'm, I'm asking you to read uh, Sterling Foker, uh, Chapter 8, and a section from Dresner dealing with feminism. Um, and think about what role does gender play in international relations, and whether um, you could have an analysis of IR, you could have an, a set of tools to understand IR that didn't pay attention to gender, right? What would the danger of that be? What would be the problem if you were trying to understand international relations, but you were doing so in a way that paid absolutely no attention to gender? So I'll wrap up there, and thank you very much.